Guys, I should start with a very short story uh, giving you a different definition of what an entrepreneur is than what you normally would hear. And Webster says that an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur is a individual who organizes, manages, and assumes the risks in a business enterprise. There's a short story by Thomas Stenberg, the founder of Staples, that provides a different definition of an entrepreneur. And I want to give you that to break the ice, and after that, it's up to you. And the story goes like this. There was a family that had young twin boys. And the parents came one day and told the boys, uh, tomorrow is your birthday, so after school, come directly home because we will have a party and presents for you. The boys were very excited. The next day, as school finished, the boys couldn't wait to get home and they rushed home. Now, as they are on their way home, I should tell you that for reasons of their own, the family favored one of the boys. One of the boys was a pessimist and the other one was an optimist of the twins. And the family favored, favored the pessimist. As they uh, arrived at home, in fact, there was a party going on. The boys were very excited. They'd say hello and kiss a few relatives. And then the pessimist said to the parents, where are my presents? And the parents said, go into the family room, and there's a pile there for you. The boy rushed into the family room, and indeed, there was a pile of toys and gadgets. And at first, he was very excited. But then he became very sad, worried, anguished. Someone who was watching him said, what's wrong? He said, well, look at this. A lot of these toys use batteries. What am I going to do if, when the batteries die and I cannot find the right batteries? And a lot of these toys have plastic parts. What am I going to do when the plastic breaks? How am I going to play with this? And he continued on with that pessimistic attitude. <laughs> In the meantime, the optimist went to his parents and said, what about my presents? And they told him, well, Go into the backyard, and there's a pile there for you. The boy rushed into the backyard, and he found a huge pile of horse manure. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at that, became very excited, when I got a shovel, and began to shovel like crazy. Somebody who was watching him said, I don't understand it. All you got is a pile of horse manure, and look how happy you are. <laughs> and the optimist says, yeah. But with all this horse manure here, there has to be a great pony here someplace. <laughs> <laughs> so the moral of the story is that to be an entrepreneur, you have to be an optimist. You have to see what other people do not see. And I can tell you, you have to be prepared to shovel an awful lot of horse manure. <laughs> okay. So with that, why don't you just open up? And I'll do my best. I don't know that I have an answer for every question you post, but I'll do my best. I thought we'd start at this end of the room. Is that okay with a question? And then we'll just we'll go, we'll we'll wind around back to um, me and Darren. Now, can I ask something before you ask a question? Just give me a statement about yourself, like that, kind of like why you are in this class. So just a very short statement. So give me some. Um, I'm in this class because I've always been interested in having my own business sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, it's also a part of the curriculum for a business major, so. Okay. Um, yeah. And I guess my question <coughs> on which we have to be. <gasps> first. Um, so, uh, briefly, in the book and then in other areas, it was mentioned that you um, have become an investor in a lot of startup companies since you read your endeavors. And I was just curious, what was one of your favorite startup companies that you participated in and why? Um, was it was it the creative okay. element or the... Uh, personally, I invest not a lot because uh, the first criteria that I have is that I'm not looking for headaches. Okay, I'm at a point in my life where, where I'm not looking for major headaches. 
the model of what I invest in is typically this. It's, it's a little bit unusual. It is uh, an individual or more who have a bright idea, who I think, which I think has a future in an area where it's not just money. I think one thing that people don't understand is that money, in fact, is a smaller part of the picture. The bigger part is doors and contacts, you know, opening the right doors. Uh, so an area where I can, where I feel like I do, I can open the right doors, I will invest some money, open the right doors, and then somebody who is coachable, okay, and someone who doesn't know all the answers. So that's the, the typical model of what I, of what I get involved in. And I got involved in not that many <coughs> situations, a limited number, because uh, as I said, it's, it's, the criteria is I'm not looking for headaches unless I feel very, very comfortable. I don't get involved. Was there a particular project that you saw as being just more creative, just in general, some kind of startup that you thought it was a great idea that you'd want to share? Well, actually, or it was a fun experience to be? No, I'll give you one example. And in fact, I'll give you an example I think is more appropriate of one that that I came very close to getting involved and I didn't. And I think the reason why, and something I saw recently, is worthwhile. Uh, I was watching just about a month ago or so, by accident, I was watching this program, I don't know if you've seen it, called The Sharks or so on TV, where they have- Shark the, Tank. Shark Tank? Yeah. And they have, have you seen that program where they have a, well, basically they have a, a number of, of venture capitalists or investors and people come with ideas and ask them to invest. There was a lady that came up, and it was very impressive. She had these shoes or platforms. I don't know if you have seen that, but here, here there was a basic idea. You know, it's for women. And women uh, use uh, the platform used in the shoes for women. It's basically the same platform. What changes is the top, okay? And you can take the same platform and create a sports shoe, or you can create a dress shoe, you can create multiple colors, okay? So there's this lady that was running this out of her home, was asking for money, and had started in a year, if I remember correctly, she already had done like a million dollars, or a million and a half dollars. Really was very private. Well, about five years ago, a fellow came to me, and with exactly that idea, <laughs> and, and some models that were beautifully done, and it worked like a charm. You know, you have a platform and you have the top and you just click it and so on. And I loved it. Okay. And I would have invested immediately. But then, and here's the thing, and there's a lesson in this. When you bring a deal to somebody to invest, you have to bring a clean deal. Okay? So this fellow, what he had is a mess. And I found it interesting because a woman in that program said that she owned the patent of this thing. Mm -hmm. And this fellow owned the patent five years ago. So I don't know who wants what. <laughs> but, but basically, he had done this. He had made a deal with someone who he claimed owned the patent. Okay? Then he had gotten some investors on that who put some money. Then they all had a fight, and they were all entangled in about three different lawsuits. Okay? So although I loved the idea, and I thought it had a tremendous amount of power, the mess that he brought to me, I just decided it wasn't worth it. Uh, so that's an example of one that I like, but the any best. I don't know if I, but I'm giving you the reason why. And the lesson on that is, if you're going to do something and you're going to get somebody to invest in you, you've got to bring a clean deal, not a messy deal. Anything else? How did you discover that it wasn't a clean deal? Like, how did you know? In this particular case, I, well, first of all, I'll do my homework. And one of the things that, that I would tell somebody is, uh, you better tell me all the good and all the bad. Because if I find something that you didn't tell me, that's the keys of death. So this man just undressed in front of me. Nancy? Um, my name is Nancy, and I'm in the program with the class because it is part of the curriculum for our program. But I'm also very interested in what it takes to be an entrepreneur, and um, I, I love this class because we're meeting entrepreneurs 
personally view and through um, videos, and uh, and I find that very interesting to see real life examples. Great. And the projects that we're doing also give us a little insight as to what it's going to be like in the real world. <laughs> So um, my first question is, how, how do you feel about mission and vision statements and the importance of sticking with that throughout your career? And as that involves, um, how, how do you um, stick with it and, and make that the uh, the goal of your of your project. You know, in my experience, and that of some friends of mine that I have discussed this with, and I think I made reference to a couple of cases in here of that. You, know, you start a business and you have a path and a plan, okay, whatever that is, and it tends to be narrow, or it should be narrow. Now, typically. Typically, or in the large majority of cases, you're not swimming in money. Okay, you're hurting for money. So that means that that you get faced with opportunities to make some money that diverge from your main track, and it's really tough, very very tough to say no. Okay. So my first uh, choice is frankly to say no and stay on the narrow path. Now, you may be facing some survivability. You, you really may not be able to make it to the next month if you don't do something else to raise some money. So you have to digress. But I would say you want to keep, as long as you're convinced that you have a plan and you have a goal and, and you feel very confident as to the opportunities in what you're doing, I would say absolutely do whatever you can not to digress. Now, sometimes you have to digress just to survive. Okay. You mentioned that you give a couple of examples about how you, you in fact, have said no and turned down deals that could have benefited you um, in the short term, but not necessarily in the long term, and deviated from your goal and turned out to be way to your benefit. So I just <clears throat> wonder if you think that that's something that's uh, Well, as I said, I... By and large, I stayed on track. Okay? Mm -hmm. But there were exceptions. I'll, I'll give you one. I started here in Santa Barbara. Okay? Uh, we were self-funded, which means we were starving. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, I had an opportunity here from uh, Raytheon, had a project that was in real trouble. Okay? We, were, we were in the area of, of software tools and software development. So we had some, some pretty fancy. Uh, techniques, and there was a manager at Raytheon that was familiar with what we were doing. We were a small company, had about six people at the time, and they came and they said, "If you help us in this particular project that is in trouble, uh, you know, we're going to pay you well for that, for the help." Frankly, that was a digression, okay? But we took it. We, we were we digressed for about eight months. It turned out to be a great reference and open some doors for us, but it was a digression, it was a calculated digression. But, but the f if I had not been hurting economically, I probably would not have done it. And there were others that were major digressions that we said no. No. I have no regrets at all. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, if you're closing your doors, if you don't do something, and you have to sell ice cream, you sell ice cream mm -hmm. to, to stay in business. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tara? My name is Tara, and I am in this class because I would eventually like to open my own business, and it's also part of the curriculum and the entrepreneurship program. Um, my question for you is, in um, Chapter 3, you talk a lot about the characteristics of team members and choosing team members that fit those characteristics. I recently um, conducted my first like, interview process in hiring and hired a new employee, and I thought that it fit the characteristics and everything that I was looking for, and now that it's a few weeks into it, it's not. So do you have any advice in determining or questions to ask when going through the interview process to make sure that person really does fit your desires? 
I'm sorry, you were the interviewer or the interviewee? Interviewer. You were the interviewer. Mm -hmm. You know, if I had all the answers, I would be doing very well. Uh, I'll tell you in general this, just as a general rule of thumb. Uh, if you're hiring people, okay, if you hire three individuals and you hit the jackpot with one, you're doing very well. Okay? So in general, in general, over the long term, it will take, you need to hire three people to end up with one good individual. So that's one. Second, you try to look for attitude. And the particular attitude is not the me, 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 for somebody who is, who is looking for a job. Because the key thing that anyone needs to understand to be a successful employee and to grow in a company is that you're there to solve problems. You're not there to create problems, okay? And and uh, I'm looking for, for a potential employee that gives me the feeling because they have done the homework or the way they express themselves that they're there to help me solve problems, not to, not to be a problem, okay? Uh, I definitely would do a background check, see the individual, uh, what kind of jobs, if any, they had before. Uh, anyone, anyone who has had five jobs and last ten months in each job, I will hire. Okay, uh, you're looking for for somebody who, who uh, sticks with something for a while. That doesn't mean that someone who has made a mistake or went into a place. But in general, you're looking for consistency and commitment. And so you're checking for. I mean, you also would do a check for for integrity, honesty. You are, you are looking for me. Uh, I did something when I was hiring people that worked for me. And uh, regrettably, and this is one of the biggest beefs that I have, we have a legal system that is the most anti-entrepreneurial situation you can think of. And one of the problems is that when you are hiring somebody, somebody will give you a reference. I worked for the XYZ company. And you call that company, <coughs> and typically the manager at the other end doesn't want to give you any information, not because they don't want to give it, but because there's all kinds of legal liabilities as to what they say, okay? So you have to heal, use your, your tact in trying to extract as much as you can from an individual, put him at rest, and, and make him feel that, hey, you know, whatever you tell me is going to be in total confidence, and I'm not going to use it in any other way, but we're a small company, we can make a mistake, so help me out. So you try to extract that kind of information. So it's an aggregate of those things. I'm not quite sure what else to do. Yes. To add to that, did you ever employ the tactic of two interviews, not just making a decision on interviewing somebody one time? Did you try to bring them back again to see are they consistent with their behaviors in the first time that I met them? Well, absolutely. And here's another thing. Uh, it depends how big your company. If you have a company and you're starting and you have, uh, this is going to be the second or the third employee, remember, you are everything. You're, you're the interviewer, you're the head of the department, you're everything, <laughs> okay? Now, if you have grown, and let's say you now have a company that has 30 people, and you're not having those 30 people, you have two or three people that are managers because you have so divided the company, then absolutely you have that individual uh, talk to the, the other ma the managers that you have, even those that he's not, he or she is not going to work for. Okay. Have him give you the inputs uh, for many reasons. One, because if you're a starting company, you want to help your own manager develop and have confidence and make mistakes and learn from the mistakes. And uh, also because they are managers because you thought highly of them and so you will value their opinion. So absolutely. My name is Michelle. Um, I'm taking this class because I've wanted to start I want to start my own business in the future. Um, actually, it's kind of piggybacking off of hers, kind of, sort of. Um, I really want to open up my own preschool. That's like my, my dream business to start. Now, the thing with opening up a preschool is that you start with a team. So, and you can only know so many good preschool teachers who are willing to take that kind of a cut 
what do you suggest with having to start with a team with only maybe two or three people that, that you would know and can trust? You know, that little chapter that I wrote about team members, I want to emphasize something. When you start a business, you don't have a team. You are it. Right, that's why, yeah. You know, you're the driver, the cleaner, everything, okay? So the team is something that evolves with time. And you're going to make mistakes. And you have to be very careful where you have personal relationships. Because the following happens. On the positive side is uh, here's someone that you know and hopefully you can trust, okay? So issues of, of envy, of, of backstabbing, and so on. You know that, that they should not exist, okay? It's a known quantity. On the negative side, uh, you never really know a person on that you are in the battlefield with that individual. And if you decide, you cannot afford to have the wrong person in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're probably stretching yourself to, to pay some salary or to make it be there. So you cannot afford to have the wrong person in the position. So if it's the wrong person, even if it is your sister, mm -hmm. You're going to have to say, I'm sorry, this is not working out. And that is going to be, typically, it's very damaging in your personal relationship. Okay? And you're going to be torn because you're going to go home and you say, you know, I know this person. I mean, he's my cousin, my sister, my best friend. So that gets very touchy. So it's a, you know, you have a tremendous balance. Uh, you know, one comment that I give to people that ask me, uh, when they are, it's not exactly an answer to your question, but when they are starting a business, you often have say, well, I'm starting with my best friend or my best two friends. And the one thing that I always tell them is have an agreement in writing what's going to happen if you don't get along and you decide, you decide to part the company. Because in the large majority of cases, that's what happens. Okay? Uh, so I would say. The positive is that you know that individual well. The negative is if it doesn't work, you have a headache. And from day one, if you are not willing to face that headache, then don't hire you. Okay? Do you have um, personal experience with going into business with family members and friends that didn't work out? or? Uh, yes, I have positive and negative. Uh, when I was at UCLA, I started a consulting company with my best friend, who was also in the faculty. And we really fa had an issue, and we were doing well as a small consulting outfit. And then we ran into problems. He, uh, you know, as money began to come in, it really affected him. And he wanted to start spending money on things that I thought was, was an absolute waste, okay? And so we, we part the company, and in fact destroyed the consulting business. But we were it, the two of us. And we, we were good friends, very, very close together. And frankly, that uh, put an ice on the friendship for many years. I mean, many years afterwards, we got together again and are friends again. But for many years, we, we just parted the company. Now, in the company I started here in Santa Barbara, <coughs> Uh, my brother was my partner, and that's a challenge, okay? But uh, I think we tried very hard, and we will have awful fights in private, in private, in the company, and outside the office, uh, it was a very clean relationship, and because, because we were brothers, there will be days that we would have a terrible day at the office, and we would have dinner, a family dinner that night, <laughs> and we totally both managed to leave the issues at work at work, okay? And so that worked very well. <coughs> and to this day, we have a wonderful relationship. Uh, but that was a challenge. That was a challenge. I have two friends here in town, in fact, in this town, who started a very successful company. And they're brothers, and they were very close brothers. And it's a very sad story. Uh, they became very successful, and to this day, they don't talk to each other. Hmm. You know, they're part of the company, they don't talk to each other. By the way, the interesting thing is, you have fights on success, not on failure. 
okay? Because when there is failure, there is nothing to fight about. <laughs> it's only when there is success mm -hmm. yeah, that, interesting. that you have fights. That's a good point. Go ahead. I'm Eva. I'm in the business program as well. And um, I guess a lot of the classes that I've been taking in the business program talk a lot about passion. And I'm just wondering if what you're passionate about passionate about outside of work, does that carry over into your work life? Uh, <clears throat> let me think for a moment. <laughs> you know, I personally, I would say the same thing for the entrepreneurs <clears throat> that are my friends, okay? There is a passion to succeed. There's a passion, tremendous passion to succeed, okay? And that drives your life. And that doesn't mean that you don't enjoy swimming or playing tennis or, or playing volleyball and enjoy it very much when you're playing it. But, but I think, I mean, life doesn't work that way. But, but if I had, uh, for example, I'm a swimmer. And I, all my life I swim. And I love swimming. But if you really put me in this unique situation where you said, it's your passion to do your entrepreneurial thing or swing, there's no fight. I mean, I would pick the entrepreneurial thing. It's, it's, the, it's the thing that drives you. I mean, this, this ability to accomplish certain things uh, drives you. Okay, so you have to have that passion. And the, I think the more relevant point is that, that I can assure you, it doesn't matter how successful you are, it doesn't matter how good things look, events look, you are going to hit a wall of fire more than once that unless you have tremendous passion and a commitment to success, you will quit, okay? And unless you have this desire that you say, you know, this whole thing is on fire, what am I going to do? And well, you'll find a way. You'll either become a golfer or, or you fly or you go around, but you find a way, okay? And the only way that happens is because you have that, that passion that I can't fail. So yeah, I, I, I'm a strong believer that if you don't have the passion, and by the way, when you said about investing, I'm looking for passion. Okay, I'm looking for an individual that, that has that passion. Hey, I'm Jason, I'm uh, also in the business program and have a small business of my own, so I'm taking this class to learn more, can, uh, help me out, help me uh, succeed. So uh, in your op-ed piece that you wrote in the news press, you uh, mentioned reforming the legal environment for small businesses and saying how bad basically the legal environment is for some small businesses. And then you mentioned when you, that your business that you started probably wouldn't have succeeded today due to the legal environment. Is there a certain change in a certain point where the, that scale tipped against entrepreneurs instead of for them, or has this just been a build up through time of little laws getting added, it's basically detrimental to the success of entrepreneurs. You know, you open the door for me on a subject that is very dear to me. Uh, and this comment is irrespective of where you sit in the political spectrum, okay? Because everyone in the political spectrum in office today is responsible. When you vote in, in the next what is city, county, state, national election, do your homework and check on that candidate. <coughs> what what is their background and what what have they done, voted on, or done with respect to entrepreneurs and businesses? Okay. Regrettably, most of the people that are in office today from both parties have never run a candy store. Okay. So they. I am amazed, okay? I have to tell you, I'm fortunate enough to, to have close friends who are in, in high political office, and I am amazed, I'm amazed about what I consider the naivete with respect to what it takes to run a business and what are the issues, okay? Now, this, the, the things that, that are being promulgated and done is insane. I'll give you an example. And I'll give you an example that is old enough that transcends political part. So we keep politics away. The state of California, and it's not the only state, it's not every state in the union, but, but 
only a number. But the state of California has the following. Uh, what kind of a business do you have? I uh, make uh, surfboard pads, like a decks or paddle boards, and then pads for the back, like short okay. boards. You have a sales permit? Yeah. Okay. When you went to get a sales permit, uh, did they ask you for a bond? Uh, no. Okay, you were lucky. Now, here's something that happens, which is totally arbitrary. Totally arbitrary and insane, okay? Now, let's just be logical for a moment. You would think that, that the government wants to facilitate you getting into business, because in fact, it's a small entrepreneur that is creating most of the jobs, right? So you think that, that you think of yourself as someone who is helping pass laws. You, you want to make it easier to facilitate it, okay? When you go to get a sales permit, which you need if you're going to, to have a store or sell anything in the state of California, the individual behind that counter, okay, who probably, most likely, has no idea what a business is like, okay, has the option to say to you, you have to post a bond at his or her discretion. What does that mean? You ready for this? <laughs> The state is worried that if you succeed, you may not pay your sales tax. So they want you to take money that they will tell you how much and put it in a frozen bank account as a bond. Just in case you don't pay your taxes, the state can collect that. Okay? Now, let me tell you what happened to me. I had no idea of this law. When I started my company, I'll tell you, I had $35,000 in cash that I had saved. That money I had to, to keep my family going and I had to start my business, okay? So every dollar is there, counted like a, like a gold coin. I walk into the, into the, what do you call it, State Board of Equalization, and this idiot says to me, <laughs> you, you have to post a bond for $10,000. No, I'm sorry, $7,000. And I say, $7,000? Yeah, that's 20% of all the money that I have. And I said, what's a bond? And what for? I said, to post a bond, because in case you don't pay the taxes. We need that. I said, what's it mean to post a bond? He said, well, you, you open an account, and a savings account on our name, you cannot touch it, because that's there to protect us, in case you don't pay your taxes. I said, but wait a second, I don't make any taxes, and I need it. I don't care. You got to put $7,000. Well, I almost fainted in front of the guy. <laughs> and then I said, no way, okay? And I became very aggressive, to tell you the truth, which is not my style. So I get, get your supervisor in here. So he got scared. So he says, let me talk to him. So he went back and totally arbitrary, came back and said, here's what we can do for you. We'll put the bond only up to make it $3,000. And, and that's it. And you know what? I decided that's as far I can take this, and, and, and I, I cannot afford to get tangled in a litigation with these people here. So I put $3,000, that was 10% of my money, I put it, it was frozen, okay? Now I checked into the law afterwards, out of curiosity, recently, and in fact, you can release the bond after three years, I believe. But the fact is, in three years, you either made it or you didn't make it, okay? So that's an example of a law that is absolutely insane, okay? <laughs> what the state should be doing is really should be telling you, you know what? For the first two years, we're not going to collect any taxes, taxes from you. That makes a lot more sense, okay? To give you a chance to, to get going. Because in fact, you are the one that's going to create employment for, for yeah. people that really yeah. produce. That's not the way it works. And that's just a small example, okay? If you read uh, that piece that I wrote in the news press, there's another thing that politicians don't understand, okay? Uh, you take where it's a healthcare law or any of the new laws, Again, political issues aside, here's what happens. Every time somebody lands on you something this thick, okay, well, you're starting. You have a very limited amount of sick money. You cannot afford to hire an accountant, hire a lawyer to <coughs> tell you how do I handle this, how does it affect me, because then you're out of sick money. It's gone. You consume it without ever getting started, okay? So every time one of these bureaucrats throws at you another set of stuff, that is going to take two things, your time, which is the most valuable thing that you have, and your money, 
dealing with those issues, they are really impacting your chances of success. And that's what's happening today. These things are just piling and piling. So my advice to you is before you vote for anyone, take a look at the record because <coughs> they may make the difference as to whether or not you succeed. Mm. Okay. Have I answered your question? Yes. yes. Yeah. Very well, thank you. My name is Alma, and I'm also um, <coughs> a business management enterprise here. And, um, I have a video business that I've had with my husband for the last nine years, and um, I'm trying to refocus it into motion graphics because I've been studying animation for the last two years. Um, and my question is, what advice do you have uh, regarding spousal support? Because you mentioned that a lot in the book, like um, in the real life experiences, like this person succeeded and the key factor was that their spouse supported um, the, the risk. Uh, and also when I go to pay my business license, they're always surprised, one, that the business is still functioning, and two, that we're still married, because I guess nine out of every 10 couples that start a business together end up getting divorced. So what advice would you have for um, marriages <coughs> doing business together? Or is it even recommendable? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a fact of life. And, uh, I've been fortunate that my own marriage survived, and but I have a lot of friends that there did, okay. And he, here's here's the fact of life. When you are an entrepreneur, when you go to work every day, you're really going to war. Okay, I mean you are going out there to the battlefield every day. That's just a fact of life, in my opinion. You can, there are people that are fortunate to have a relationship at home, whether they are married or not, that is a good one, a positive one, okay? So they don't have a battle front at home. But there are many people that have a battle front at home too, okay? So if you have a situation where you have two battle fronts, you know, one at home and one at work, uh, your chances of success go down dramatically because you're you have a limited ability of how many problems you can deal with at a time and, and where you you are focusing on, okay? And uh, it's not going to be healthy to be fighting two wars at the same time. So I would say, and, and that's what I personally have done. I mean, I, I, in my own relationship, nothing is perfect, okay? And there are issues, or there are issues, and they, they began to, to impact my ability to go to work and focus on the thing, I would sit down with my wife and say, this cannot be, I have to solve this issue. So I think you, you need to, you, you can't fight two wars at a time. It's just too much, okay? But I, I know some couples that have been very successful, so I think it's very doable. I, I would say the main thing is that both partners have to be well aware of what is, what is at stake here, and what is involved and be able to criticize each other in a constructive way. I don't know what else to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> but it's very doable. It is doable. Mm. Yes? My name is Tim, and um, I'm taking this class. It's kind of timely because my wife is a She's starting a business, so she's a uh, dipping her toes in the entrepreneurial waters, and um, I'm taking the class just to help her learn more about the obstacles she's going to face. And I can see that she has the passion, so I have faith in her. But you know, you just brought up a good point that made me think. Eventually, if it takes off, maybe I'll quit my day job and go into business, you know, and help her. But um, it's really insightful that you're going into war and to to have some sanctuary, so I'll keep that in mind for the future. But thinking about her business, you mentioned in trying to find some um, creative ways to um, get funding that suppliers might be another good source. Do you have any experiences where 
your suppliers saw the potential in your business and, and gave you funds when needed? I don't remember having that situation, but that's a, it's a very delicate issue because here's the thing. Here's the thing. Number one, a supplier is a natural to invest in your business because most likely, assuming it's a, it's a supplier with the funds to do that. So the first thing you need to do is find out if that particular supplier has the funds and the ability to invest. Don't waste your time and, and risk with it without doing your homework. Now, a supplier typically knows your business, more so if you have been dealing with that supplier for a while. And, and they know you, 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 hopefully you have paid on time, they see your business has been growing or, or have been headaches. Either way, they have a grasp on your business. So they're going to be more, much more knowledgeable, okay? As opposed to some outside individual who's just doing it for the investment purposes and is looking at your books as a main guidance as whether or not they invest. This supplier has some knowledge of business and, and probably knows, because the supplier knows the industry quite right. So that's all very positive. The, the sensitive part that you got to be careful with, but I would say it, it, it's workable because typically you, you have multiple suppliers. So if something goes wrong with the supplier, you can find an alternative supplier. But the issue is that if you go to a supplier, you got to be careful how you present the situation because you don't want the supplier to think this is a headache in the making, okay? So this fellow now has, for the sake of discussion, has $10,000 credit with me. I'm going to change the credit to 3000 because I'm scared that he won't be able to pay the 10000 Now I know more of what he's doing and his headaches, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so you got to trade carefully. On the other hand, I could also explore having an alternative supplier so an alternate supplier. So if really something goes wrong in that discussion, because I decided to discuss with the supplier, that I have another supplier I can deal with. So that's the answer. That's how we we'll deal with that. Okay? I want to go back to something you said about the review. You know, you read, the, did you uh, assume so, but you read the chapter about what I know with the statement that one person's constant is another person's variable? I loved that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me tell you something on my experience. That simple statement is one of the most rewarding ways when you have a business and you want to expand the business or grow the business to look for ways to do that. Here's what I recommend that you do if you currently have a business. You know, go home, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, whatever it is that you drink. Uh, I didn't say liquid, just coffee or tea. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> and try to identify the constant in your business. You'll be surprised, okay? And then ask yourself, if I turn that constant into a variable, does that open some new doors for me, okay? You'll be surprised often the things that you will discover. Mm -hmm. And it's an iterative process, if you, if you first don't see certain constants that could be variables. But as you turn one constant into a variable and begin to play with it, all of a sudden you discover a second one, and then a third one. And, and then you say, my God, I've been looking at this for such a long time, I never realized this. Okay. So I would encourage you to do that. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Chelsea, and I'm taking this class because I'm working on my own startup business right now. And um, my first question for you is um, related to your example in your book um, from the Wall Street Journal, The Head Priest. Um, the Head what? The Head Priest. Yes. Um, and where the, the priest convinces people to come to his temple by praying on their desire to obtain a visa. Right. So my question is, I mean, I understand the significance of seeing opportunity where others do not. Um, but in this case, I felt that the priests crossed the line into manipulation. So I was wondering, in some cases, if you think that integrity is a worthy sacrifice to achieve entrepreneurial success. Well, let me say this to you. I mean, tremendous believer in integrity, okay? Uh, 
tremendous. If I have, frankly, I'm telling you this, I have terminated employees that I consider very smart and bright and so on simply because they lack integrity. Mm -hmm. And the moment I was convinced of that, I just would not have it with me. Because eventually the person that lacks integrity will hurt you. They don't hurt you today, they'll hurt you sometime in the future. Okay? And, and the opposite of that is that people with integrity and honesty uh, prevent a lot of problems from occurring. Okay? So I'm a firm believer of that. On the same token, everybody has a different definition of where the threshold is. Okay? Uh, and that's a very personal decision. Where, where is the threshold? I'm reading a book right now that is quite interesting, and I'm only about a quarter of the way through, but it's The Life of Cornelius Vanderbilt. I don't know if you know who he was, but he was a, it's called The First Titan, okay? And it's funny because I just was reading a little bit, every now I have a little bit of time to go and squeeze him on my Kindle and try to read some of it. But I was just reading a section, and the section is a discussion as to where Vanderbilt had integrity or not, okay, as he was making use of his fortune. And the author deals with two sets of opinions. One is uh, that he had a reputation that his word was his contract. If he gave you his word, he kept it. And people that dealt with him uh, put a lot of value that. On the other one, there are those that say he was a manipulator. Okay? He, he, he was right there at the beginning of the idea of the stock market of corporations. A tremendous amount of inside trade, trading and uh, trading with inside information, manipulating stocks, and so on. So a different group of people are saying he, he certainly didn't have integrity, he was manipulating this thing and taking advantage of people. So, you know, which one do you, how do you pass judgment on that? Um, it's an individual thing. But uh, again, I'm a very firm believer on integrity. Uh, I'll tell you. If you shake hands with me on something, I'm very careful in shaking hands and saying, this is, I mean, I'm really careful. But if I do, I'll keep my word, even if it was a losing proposition, okay? On the other hand, we live in an environment today where uh, everybody's litigating everybody else. So you have to have a contract sometimes, and that's part of the whole legal issue, that you, you can you have to spend a tremendous amount of money with lawyers and just about everything. Okay, so integrity, yes. What, what's a, where's the threshold? That's an individual. Okay. Um, my name is Grant. Um, I'm in the business program here, and uh, I work for a entrepreneur, and I'm constantly finding myself taking on different roles and uh, wearing different hats, as you said. And I want to know, what would you say was the most beneficial? Um, path you could find in your start. You know, here's an thing of my own experience. And, and I think it, it correlates with that of, of other entrepreneurs I have discussed this. In order to, to launch yourself, in an entrepreneurial business, you, you need to develop a certain amount of self-confidence. Not self-confidence that, that you have the right idea, that you can make it. Self-confidence that you have enough pieces of the environmental puzzle that you're going to have to deal with, that you feel confident that you can deal with. That means uh, on the legal issues. I've, I'm not a lawyer, but I feel comfortable enough that I know how to deal with it and I know when to ask for help. On the accounting issues, on dealing with the bank, on, on renting something, on dealing with the, land, the landlord and, and someone to ask me for a lease and, and making. So there's a number of pieces that uh, have to come into play on that board that you're going to be playing on. And it's a very personal thing, but I would say that, at least in my case, there was definitely a point, uh, let me put it this way, there was an evolution when I did not feel comfortable enough not on an idea to start a business, but I didn't feel comfortable enough that I had the chessboard, I understood the chessboard enough to die, okay, on all those pieces. And then there's a point where all of a sudden you say, I feel comfortable, 
I understand this piece. I'm not expert. I'm not an expert at all, but I know where to go and get some help. I know how much to spend on this. I, I, I got a sense for things, so now I'm ready to launch. Okay. So I would say that I would say then that every piece of what you're learning, whether you like it or not, for example, I hate accounting. Okay. I mean, it, it, it's not my thing, and and and. and you know, I had accountants working for me, and, and I hope there's no accounting major in here, but you know, it's a different kind of individual. It's a different kind of mentality, okay? So I don't relate to accountants very well, okay? And, and, but nevertheless, I had to learn certain accounting things to be able to convert and to be able to know what I wanted to accept and did not want to accept and what I was going to ask and not ask and so on. So I would say that the most important thing is that you get enough of those pieces to a degree where you feel comfortable with enough of those pieces so that if you want to be your own entrepreneur or if you want to help somebody else as being part of their team, that you are smart enough to know where you want to spend the time. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I'm George. Um, I'm here, well, I'm taking a class because I got a habit of just picking the classes that look the most interesting that fit my schedule. And I guess I'm here tonight to hear you talk. Um, I'm not quite sure which question to give you. I guess I will kind of offer a follow-up question to the, to the one before that you just got. Uh, I noticed in your stories that you used Baby Einstein as a business example. Uh, I find this disconcerting given that the entrepreneurs offered a product that was considered counter to what is developmentally age appropriate to children. In light of this, I wondered what your beliefs were in regard to an entrepreneur's responsibility to consumers, and how do you feel about the development of, success, of a successful business that preys on the naivety of consumers? Okay, two, two points. First of all, the reason I selected that story, I don't know the people that created it, mm -hmm. but they wrote a paper. They gave a presentation to the place, and I got a whole the paper. That was one of the few places where I found a successful company where somebody said, this is the plan that we have when we started, this is the money that we had, which is exactly the kind of example that I was looking for to fit in there. So that's why I put that in there, okay? Now, I don't judge other people in terms of what, what is uh, honest and dishonest, unfair and unfair. I judge myself on my desire to deal with them, but not their uh, action necessarily. Again, I think it's a very personal thing. I personally have to be working on a business, okay, that I feel comfortable with the business, all right? Uh, I'll give you an example, not long ago. I was asked to invest on buying some properties that are really, you know, they prey on very low income people, so I wouldn't do it because I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that, okay? That's my own judgment. Now, the people that asked me to participate with them and that they went ahead and did it, and that's their business, their conscience is fine with that, and they can do it. I wouldn't do it, okay? So I think that everyone has their own moral compass, and you have to deal with that. I personally have to feel good about what I'm doing. You know, one of the things that I felt very good is that the two companies that I was involved with, I thought they were really contributing to society, and in particular, I felt that we were contributing to this country's technological lead, and that made me feel very good, okay? But again, that's a personal thing. But you don't feel that there's any, any responsibility besides that personal responsibility, besides that personal moral compass? You don't feel that as a member of the community, you should stand against and take a stance against companies that prey on the naivety of consumers, companies that take advantage? Well, let me say this to you. Recently, a, uh, somebody that, that is very nice, very nice, and does some work for me, came to me, and believe it or not, in this town, it's a lady, she bought an automobile, okay? And she was paying 52% interest on that. And it was so convoluted in the contract that she was naive enough that she didn't realize that she was paying 52%. Now that is 
criminal, mm -hmm. particularly for a hardworking person, person that works on an hourly basis. I thought that was criminal, okay? So, and, and this lady doesn't have the economic means. So I got a lawyer, I paid for the lawyer to go after these SOBs that were doing that, okay? And she won the case and it gave me a lot of satisfaction that that, that took place. So, and right now I think whether whether the, the business is, is a corporate business or is a government entity, okay? I am personally involved in a number of things that really uh, I dislike and I think shouldn't be that way. But am I, the t me personally, the type that goes down marching down State Street, uh, raising hell on, on yeah, no, I try to I have a decent approach to life. I try to get involved in those things where I think I can make an impact and, and change the system and not just be able to see for yourself. That's my personal, and I think everyone has to have their own personal modus operandi. Do you, in any of your other writings, use that platform that you've established for yourself to convey that belief beyond that, or do you just let it go? I'm going to send the question. Do you, do you, so, to import from, uh, you find it there. You're looking for clients, you find it there. If you go to a specific conferences, which gets expensive, by the way, because you have to travel. Uh, so, you go to conferences, you find out what are the publications, if any, that deal with that particular area. Okay? And then somehow you try to get in there, you try to get in there by. First, by doing the, the non-cost uh, issues, like trying to put in a, a, uh, a news piece uh, that says, we now have opened this great company around selling uh, you know, diamonds from Brazil and have the price, whatever it is. Uh, you, in today, social, uh, Social, you know, the Facebook type environment, uh, you're probably sharper than I am. Okay, now talking there. about Facebook, I friended you on Facebook and somebody responded. I was just wondering, was that you? That was me. That was me. Because okay. it's interesting, one of my uh, uncles is, is in Brazil, he's a politician, and I wrote him an email one time and somebody else responded. And I was like, that's not him. I could tell them. So no, I was wondering. I, I did. That was a very nice email. I appreciate it. And, and I <laughs> Just curious. <laughs> but you see, I'm an old timer, okay? So for example, I have this, this website this uh, website with this book, and the fact is, uh, you know, I don't spend a lot of time pushing this book at all. So sometimes three months go by and I don't check my website. I hate to confess that, okay? And then I'm embarrassed when I go there and I see somebody send me a message, and there's always a number of them. Mm -hmm. And then I try to respond. So I might, sometimes I respond three months later, and, and you know, but to me this, nice this, it's you, so it's this, this this is a, a you know a bit of a hobby now, or hopefully a contribution. Uh, but there's a lot of things happening in the uh, in the internet world, and I think that also what that does is opens up uh, very clever opportunities for those that are thinking. I, I just saw today something that I, I, I loved. I saw today somebody sent it to me. I don't even know where they are. I think somewhere in the south. There's a church. Can I, I need to write this. Can I write this? Yeah. There's a church and it had a sign. And I guess it's one of these out of the way churches so that's looking for people to catch their attention. So they have this sign, and, and, and what I heard is that they're actually attracting a number of people just with a clever sign. And the sign went like this. It's you know, some, some general words, but huge sign in front of the church. But he said, he has this. Big space in here. And he says, what's missing? We challenge you. And then at the bottom, he said, Oh, it's good. <laughs> it was a tremendous attention catcher, enough that it was populated in the church. Okay, so I thought it was a clever gimmick. <laughs> so at any rate, uh, it's a challenge. But I think that that the beautiful thing of the internet 
and particular social networking today is that it's opening opportunities that did not exist before. Okay, uh, and opportunities that some people are, take, are finding ways and taking advantage. Of. So I would encourage you to to uh, give it as much thought as you can, because that preempts a lot of the classical old days approach that you have to advertise, and you have to do this. You don't necessarily have to advertise, mm. which is very expensive. Mm. Thank you. I need a question over here. Um, kind of in regards to the internet and web marketing and all that, um, in your book you had mentioned that um, you thought that although a name is important, it's don't spend too much time on it. Has your opinion of that changed given how of important it is to have name recognition and how that is obtained on the internet now with uh, different taggings and Google AdWords and all these different methods to be visible on the web that were kind of include that include your name? Well, first of all, I'll tell you this. Try to go and register a name today. I don't think there's an English word left in the dictionary that is not registered. Okay? <laughs> So you can spend a heck of a lot of time before you find something that comes even, let me put it this way. Your chances of finding a word that reflects your business that is not razor already, unless you buy it from someone, are really minute right now. I am astonished as to, I mean, the dictionary is, is taken, okay? So number one, you have to create something that is not going to be reflective of your business. Number one, but number two, yes, I, I still, I personally believe that if I'm starting another business, I am not worried about the name. The only thing I worry about is if it's a name that that may offend someone, if it's a name that if I have to someone who speaks a different language may mean something else in a different language that may be of interest to me, so I, I don't make a foolish mistake. So other than not creating a name that that is going to get me into trouble. I don't care what it is. And, and I want one that is easy to remember, easy to spell, all of those things. Okay. So no, I haven't changed my opinion on that. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Adrian, I'm also a business student here. Um, I appreciate your book uh, very much. Uh, the more I hear stories from entrepreneurs and business people, the more I feel like I, I can do it too. Um, it's, you know, I think you have to hear the examples and, and the real life stories and be able to think that you could be in that same position. Um, one of the things that attracts me to, to business, and you kind of alluded to it with your, it's like a war comment, it's the competition, kind of a big on sports and that kind of thing. So it's a sort of a sports inspired question for you. If you were to take the number of business ventures or products and equate them to wins and losses, would you have a lifetime record, a winning lifetime record? Would you, me? In other words, would you be above 500? Me would you personally? have more wins or more losses? Me personally? Yes. Okay. <laughs> It's a good question. Let, let me answer to you this way. And not just on me, I have some very good personal friends who are successful entrepreneurs. And we go on vacation together sometimes. And so, I mean, we chat this a topic of, of elaborate discussion, okay? Uh, first, I will tell you this. The difference between success and failure is this much. This, this one. But here's the interesting thing. I don't know, I personally don't know. In my own case, and with friends, I don't know a single entrepreneur who hasn't have a monumental faith. Okay? But recover from that. And, and rather than, than, than retreat, have said, I have now learned, and now I'm ready to do it right. And try it again, and be very successful. So, I'm not sure how to calibrate win and losses that way, because you can have uh, tremendous losses, but but if you recover, who cares? Okay. Uh, you can have small wins and great losses, great losses and uh, and large wins, and so on and so. On. The bottom line is, are you still walking at the end of the whole thing? Okay. <laughs> And uh, and that's how I keep score. So I don't know how to quantify it other than yeah, I'm walking. And I'm here. <laughs> so you're okay. winning. Yeah. 
And I have, like, there is a story there, which is an absolutely true story. And in fact, I just went on vacation with this fellow uh, a month ago, and uh, which is about the, the wholesaler. You remember the story about the fellow who, who was in the wholesale business? You remember that one? The this one who went to South, wait, Puerto Rico? Right, went from Boston to Puerto Rico and so on. Okay. Here is someone who, who <clears throat> at least a couple of times from nothing, made a lot of money and lost it, but wasn't afraid and got right back into it, okay? And, and eventually was very successful, and he's walking, and walking very well, hmm. okay? So, you know, it's like, it's like a war. You lose a battle, you just don't want to lose a war, but, but you won't win every battle. business and learn a whole lot and learn more. Um, I like your idea of constants and variables and changing constants to variables, but I don't know if I think that way. I wouldn't have come up with the idea of the elevator using mirrors and the example with the fellow in the pins. I don't think I can do that. So is the constants and variables idea something that you can learn with practice and get better at, or is it just something that you naturally have and you need to find someone else to help you out? I think you can. I think you can develop on yourself on that. Simply by, I think the pain example is, is a simple example and a, and a good example. Is that you know you're in the pen business. You put the pen in front of you, and you just begin to blabber to the pen. What happens if, if I do this? And what happens if I do that? Now, there's no question that there are many things that you're going to see somebody else do, and you say, "But that was in front of me, and I missed it." But that's okay. That's okay, because the trick is not that you missed a hundred, but that you discover one or two. That's all you need, okay? So no, I think that, that you can do it yourself, and the more you know about a particular business or potential business, the more you're gonna be able to find your constants and making variables. Another, you know, I, I provided in the book about three, I forgot, three or four schemes that I have used. Uh, the issue of, of drawing a picture, a graph, of what you're doing, I find that extremely tough. Because what you're doing is, really, you, you say, okay, I'm going to draw a graph of, uh, you were in the, in, the, in the board business, right? Okay, uh, let's just say that, that he, I don't know what he does with it, but let's say that he builds it from scratch, okay? So if he were to sit down and say, I'm going to build it, I'm going to go, he's going to start, I'm going to, go into the business of doing that. So let me write a diagram, because I think I know the business very well. I know what it takes. And he begins to draw the diagram, and all of a sudden, there are all kinds of holes. Hmm, what about this piece? Well, does it really go here? Does it, where does it come from, and so on? So the effort you're going to do in order to fill out the diagram, so you really understand what is involved in this process, is going to help you tremendously on your understanding of the business. Okay, so that's one scheme. The scheme of, of the constants is one. The scheme of, if it's something that lends itself to it, of the data and the process. And, and see, where I give the, uh, the uh, Morse code example, where you really look at the data and the process. That's incredibly worthwhile. You know, what am I manipulating here? What am I doing with this? And then is this the only way to manipulate it? Can I manipulate it in a different way? Okay, where are the bottlenecks? A simple thing that, that I find that I'm amazed how many people don't do that is whatever you're doing, do a pie diagram and, and, and see what the segments are. Because you can have the most wonderful solution in the world and all you have to improve is 1%. Okay, you shouldn't be working on that piece of the pie. You should be working on one that, that consumes 40 or 30 or 50%. So any small improvement on that is going to impact your pie diagram. So there's a number of things that, that techniques that you can use. And yes, I think you can find your own constants. I have to tell you this. I went to, I, I, um, I don't care very much for giving presentation these days. I have a different, a different stage in my life. So I enjoy this class, and I enjoy some classes that I go to, but I don't care to do it. But I gave a presentation at the Chamber of Commerce this last year. And, and uh, there was a fellow 
that was uh, given a prize. And I have to tell you about that because I thought it was wonderful. So, so one of the things that, that I did, the presentation, is, these are all small businesses. And so I suggested that they take this constant approach and variable and go home and look at, at the constant in their business and try to see if they can turn them into variable. Then, right after that, they give a prize to this fellow that owns a funeral home. I think the funeral home, if I remember correctly, has a place in Ventura and a place here. Okay. And it was fascinating because his business apparently has a very successful small business, a funeral home. And so he got up and he thanked people for giving him the prize of the business man of the year and so on. And he says, I just realized that I use, I mean, I hadn't become aware that I did it, but I use a, the constant and variable approach. And why? Here's the basic idea as I understood it on his funeral business, okay? How does the funeral business work? You take the dead body to the funeral home, right? Somebody dies and you take the dead person to the funeral home. Well, he doesn't do that. Uh, a church will call him or someone, or it could be a private home, and he brings the services to the dead person. Okay, he changed the variable. And that's what he does. That's his business. Okay? <laughs> Instead of bringing the dead person to the funeral, he brings the funeral to the dead person. Okay? And he seems to be doing quite well. And then he did something that I thought was very funny. Uh, people <laughs> said, uh, I'm sure that many people will come and, and embrace me and congratulate me for my success. He said, <laughs> when I embrace people, I sort of incline this, word, this way. That's just the way I embrace people. He says, please don't think that I'm measuring you. <laughs> I thought it was wonderful. <laughs> so yes, I encourage you to do that. I think you'll be surprised with yourself. Yes. Um, hello, I'm David. Um, I've worked for um, about three different entrepreneurs in the past eight years. Um, that I've learned something different from each one of them. Um, and I'm taking this class not so much so that I can just directly become an entrepreneur, but so that I can continue to support entrepreneurs in whatever capacity I can, and um, continue to learn more from them, so that if um, in this long path that I'm taking, I do find something that I have a passion for and want to start doing, um, I, I have the opportunity to do that, and I've built up this knowledge. now. To continue to pursue my my knowledge of these things, I'm, I guess I'm probably asking a question that was asking that was asked earlier, but in just a different way. Um, as I'm approaching entrepreneurs and, and offering my expertise in the production aspect of things, or the all of these things that I've done production, I've done sales, administration, I've done um, product planning, all of these different things. How do, what, what do you look for in an individual that can be kind of, for lack of a better word, a, a, a way of being that impresses you and, and makes you interested in them as a potential um, member of your organization? The answer is the most straightforward and simple I can give. I want you to solve problems for me. Okay? Okay. I want to be able to come in in the morning and say, David, right? Mm -hmm. And say, David, take care of this for me. And feel confident that you're going to do a good job. And I can go on and worry about something else. Okay. I don't want at the end of the day for you to come and give me an excuse. It would be the best excuse in the world. You know, my aunt died, I, my car broke down. I don't care about those things. I, I have a problem I need to solve. And that's what I need, okay? okay? And if you do that, you'll be surprised. If I go up in life, I'll take you with me. I have to be insane not to do it. Mm -hmm. That's one thing, by the way, that, that I'm just amazed. It's such a basic thing that people don't understand, okay? Not everybody's an entrepreneur, and people, most people work for somebody else. Uh, whoever you work for, they have problems. They have all kinds of problems. What they are looking for is for someone who helps them solve problems. If you solve problems for your employer, 
you don't have to worry about about when you're going to give me a raise. When you going to do something for me, okay? If you're really solving problems for your employer, your employer will worry about not to lose you. And, and you'll get your raise, you'll get the opportunity, and so on, and they will take you with them. What you have to worry about if you, the, if you are fortunate enough to develop that relationship, then you want to do everything in your power to see that your boss grow in life because you go up with him or her. Okay? But that is, I mean, it's just as simple as that. Hi, my name is Raul. Um, I enjoy reading your book, and I wanted to commend you for, I forget what chapter it is, but when they talk about, the, I think it was the French company coming to see you and wanted to buy your company, yeah. and they were offering you, I think, 20% more, and then you declined it because you had promised your employees that you were going to keep their jobs. I thought it was pretty, pretty cool. Um, my question is kind of similar to Marcia's. It's more in like the, mar the marketing aspect of it. Um, I think you talked about it, but one of the areas I really like was like patents and, and like you said, uh, if, uh, if you plan to do business international, you have to make sure that, that someone doesn't already have that name registered. So I guess what I'm trying to ask is, uh, I don't know if you narrow it down to like maybe three, but uh, like what price of elimination for names for your company did you have, if any, and why did you end up with soft tool? Like what was it about the name itself that, that uh, attracted you in order to keep it? And, Go well, I can tell you a couple of stories about that. Uh, first of all, when we started the company, we really didn't spend very much time on a name. Okay, what is a company about? Software tools. Mm -hmm. Well, software tool is too long. Let's contract it, and we came out with software. Okay, that was it. There was no other depth to it. We were fortunate enough that in those days we didn't have the issue of, of registration of names and so on. So we didn't have anybody to compete. With. Okay. In fact, we did it so quickly that we did not realize that that word carries a connotation with it, too. You know, there's a, a sexual connotation with it that some people would, oh, yeah. would, would take with that. And so that was a subject of some, for, for some uh, jokes along the way. I didn't care. We didn't care. Okay? Most people in the profession understood that soft tool meant software tool. We have it's funny because we have a partner in Australia in my company, and they always go by their initials and their ass. And my boss always tells them, that You do know that you know, it reads ass, and then they put it everywhere, and they're like, Yeah, but they don't care. So, in fact, I don't know if I should I, I should tell this story because it's an yeah. absolutely yeah. true story. We should have, we should have, we should, we, we used to have users group meetings, okay? That means we had enough of a user base large enough international. And we would have uh, original once a year, then twice a year, one international, one national. We would have users come and, and users would give papers about how they use the products and so on and, and have discussion sessions and all that. And we used to have a very good sales lady, very good sales lady in our company. And she took excellent care of her customer. And her last name was Wiener. Okay? And so this man is giving a presentation. And they asked, he was giving a presentation to other users. And they asked him, I think he came from France. They asked him, what motivated you to come to this particular meeting? He says, look, my salesperson, her name is Winner, and she works for Softool. How can I not come? <laughs> <laughs> and the place just, just came down. You know? uh, so, so you have to put up with those jobs. <laughs> my name is uh, Anthony Hidalgo. I'm in the entrepreneurship program here. And um, I'm a... I'm, uh, Hairstylist, uh, independent contractor. I, I'm interested in opening my own salon, and actually, I got um, an opportunity to actually go for it. Um, but I'm really not, I'm not too sure or like, kind of shaky ground still. Um, the owner right now, she, uh, she wants to keep her house under the lease, and I'm, I'm not sure, and she wants me to take over. So I'm not, I'm not sure on, um, really what I should look out for, or any advice that you can give to me, because she wants me to take over the business, but she's gonna stay on the lease as a partnership with me as well. So I'm not sure what I should look out for, or what should I do, because everything's like under her name, and here I come, you know? So, you know, responsibility's on me, but she kinda, right. she's still gonna be there. You know, with uh I have to be careful what I say because that's very little information. But in general, 
it's a combination of things. Yeah. One is uh, what responsibilities do you feel you have to that lady mm -hmm. in terms of what he is providing for you. Mm -hmm. okay. If it's purely a business situation, I would lay out what are my what is the business situation here? What, what are the opportunities? What am I going to make? What kind of effort I have to put into this? Uh, and in today's environment, okay, uh, space should be the least of your problem. Unless she happens to have the space right at City Hall and takes care of all the city employees or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's an awful lot of space available. So that shouldn't be your problem. Uh, I, I said, unless you feel that relocating the business loses quite a bit of if it came to that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but in general, you have to look at it as a business situation. Okay. Yeah. Now, the fact is, I mean, business, personal, personal issues come into, into mm -hmm. play. Because if you have a person here who, uh, to create an environment, who is an elderly lady who's mm -hmm. giving you an opportunity and could sell it to somebody else for giving it to you and the, and the business has a good cash flow, mm -hmm. okay, and, and you feel it's really giving an opportunity I wouldn't have otherwise, so I have to bend a little bit and, and, and give her an ability to also to benefit from this more than I would if it was Joe Blow that walked in the street. And I think those are all factors to take into consideration. That's, that's what I would do. But you've got to look at it as a business. Mm -hmm. And you have to analyze it before you jump. What are the consequences? Yeah. Okay. And what are the consequences? I mean, you don't want long-term commitments of any kind unless you really understand how your business is progressing. But mm -hmm. if you start a business that you really don't know what kind of cash flow you're going to have and so on, and enter into commitments, you better be careful. Yeah. All right. Thank you. AJ's the cameraman. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to let Darian go and then I'll take the last question. My name's Darian. Um, I'm in this class because I think I could do well to learn anything in the entrepreneurial realm. I tend to. Uh, bite off a little more than I can chew at times, and uh, I feel like I'm a perfectly capable individual, but I need to learn um, discipline in the realm of time management and, you know, things of that nature. So my question for you as a successful entrepreneur is, uh, how do you balance your work and life successfully? Between my balance between private and business or within the business? Um, yeah, but also... Uh, yeah, which one? <laughs> Um, I, I guess in terms of getting things done for a debt, so business, in terms of business, okay. you know, um, most of my efforts have, uh, you know, been semi-successful, you know, even when I was, my most prestigious, you know, leadership position I ever had was I was an editor of the school paper at a community college before coming here, and even, even during that, and I felt like I did a, a, a fair job, a good job. But even so, I had to end up. I ended up dropping a class, you know, because the uh, the workload was simply too much. And I'm work, you know, I'm working through college, so I have, I have my daily employment, you know, and then I have my um, my hobbies and whatnot, and I have my deadlines for the paper, my homework. I was taking like two or three English classes along with the editorship, and so uh, that's something I've learned about myself that I need to uh, you know improve. And so I'm wondering. If uh, you know, in terms of organization, time management, you know, decision making, you know, if you have any uh, thoughts or ideas you can share. You know, personally, what I do, not necessarily on paper, sometimes I do this mentally. Okay, I literally draw a pie diagram in my mind, yeah. and I and I and I divide it into sections, and I decide how important they are to me. Where, where, where am I putting, what are the things that I consider really important, okay? And then uh, I prioritize them, or I give them a higher weight. And then it's, if, if I feel that I personally don't like to do a, a halfway job, when I do something I like to do it well, or mm -hmm. I don't do it. So if I don't feel that I'm doing, that I have enough time or enough resources to do something well, then something has to go. Just as simple, just like when, when somebody, you have employees and, and, and somebody not doing the job, you have to face it and you got to terminate. So, and, and that's not, nobody enjoys terminating anybody. Okay, but you have to do it. So it's the same thing. I, I would look at what I intend to do, what I think is going to take me, 
And if I don't think I have enough time to do all those things well, then I have to eliminate one before I even start. And if I discover later on that I miscalculated, and in fact, I thought I could do these five things and I can only do three, well, two have to go. So, so how do I find a phase out process to phase mm -hmm. out of those? I mean, it's just as straightforward as that. Yeah, it's pretty uh, straightforward. Thanks. By the way, there's something I want to throw you away, but you got those of you that, which I think mostly want to start at least. Here's something I learned. And, and it was, I learned out of necessity. Here's the thing, you start a business, and you, know, you have limited experience, you have limited resources, and you're facing a new problem every day. In fact, you're, you're facing multiple new problems every day. Whether it's accounting or legal or, or a lease or whatever it is, it's just multiple new problems. Well, you can look for gurus to help you on everything. Number one, because it's very expensive. And number two is, gurus don't necessarily give you the right answer. Okay? So, you begin to suffocate, literally. And, and what I did, out of necessity, when I entered that phase is, literally sit down and use as much common sense as I could and develop an approach and just do it, okay? As my company grew and we kept facing more difficult problems, and I couldn't afford to, to have a, a team of lawyers looking at every little thing and so on. I mean, we, we, you have to make decisions that can cost you if you do the wrong thing. So, so we did have legal advice for what we needed and so on. But there are many, many things, for example, on employee relations and on many other things. Where as we began to grow, I, I would gather the three or four managers that I had and I would say, listen, let's come up with how we're going to do this. You know, I don't know how IBM does this. Or I don't know how General Electric does this, but let's come up with a common sense way and we're going to do this. Well here's the interesting thing, and, and we we did that very well. And here was an interesting thing. When the company was sold and it was acquired by a much larger company, I kept meeting uh, former employees that would come to me and would say, you know, there's one thing that I never appreciated uh, at Softool, and that is, where in the hell did you figure out, did you get the advice to do things that way and that way and that way? Uh, because in, in the new company, it's a mess. Okay? <laughs> and these are people that, you know, we were acquired by a billion dollar company. So it's a mess, okay? Or I left them for whatever reason, I'm working for, for another huge company, and it's a mess. And yet we had, we really had our act together. And that was, that was quite interesting, to, to get that many people that I still find, I bump into a restaurant here or so, and, and would say to me, uh, I, I miss how well we were doing certain things. The point is that we just common sense it out. We, we figured out. So I encourage you not to be afraid, okay? You don't need gurus. You know, if you're facing a problem, sit down and use your best common sense approach in how you solve the problem. And you'll be surprised how well you do. And then you make mistakes, and you correct the mistakes. And next time, you know, after a couple of mistakes, you've got a pretty good procedure. And a good, pretty good approach on how you do that. And I really would encourage you to, to think that way. You'll be surprised how helpful that can be. Okay, I have a, well, a comment. I mean, one of the things that keeps coming back to me listening to you today is taking the time to think about the big picture and you know looking at your business because for me it's speaking to me personally I'm so busy all the time you've got meetings you're running your business you're paying your bills or whatever it is that eats up your day and then um, really how important it is to step back and take the time to kind of take in the big picture and and do some analysis of where you're going you know what your future is going to look like and and doing some s s strategy but um, my question for you is about the economy. You know, this is a challenging time, I think, for small businesses. And, you know, the economy, it's no secret, it's in the toilet. And we, you know, there's certain things you hear about, well, a, a recession is a good time to start a business because you've got, um, you know, cheap labor, you have, um, you know, maybe you have less competition because 
um, you know, areas are being freed up by big businesses downsizing in certain areas. And so I'm just wondering if you have any bits of wisdom or encouragement or insight about, you know, what lessons we're learning during this down economy and how small businesses and entrepreneurs can be encouraged to move forward. I wish I had the answer to that for my own benefit. Uh, one of the scary things is that I said I, I went on vacation a couple of months ago, and I was there with a couple of very successful entrepreneurs and good friends that went on vacation together. And them, as well as I, are terribly worried about our own future and the future of the country. Okay, so uh, to me, it was scary to to with the commonality of what we worry about. I think we're living in difficult times. Okay. I, I don't know. I, I, on the big scheme of things, okay. Uh, as I said, do your homework on who you vote for, because people are having a tremendous impact on your life. Tremendous impact. I see things that that worry me tremendously. Today, for instance, I read an article today. I don't know if you saw that. I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, which is what I read. And there was an interesting article, but it's symptomatic, OK? Uh, the Chinese just, just uh, have a new, I don't know if any one of you, of you saw the news on them. The Chinese have a new device, a, a small submarine type, that allows them to go to great depth, OK? So they went. Uh, down this, this, for the Chinese, they set a record. They went down to something like 5,400, 5,500 uh, meters, I think, or meters. And what is happening is at the bottom of the ocean, uh, these covers are being made of all kinds of, of uh, new materials and so on. So it's a great opportunity to them. But then the article had a comparison. You know, the, the United States. Uh, the last time that we improved on a submergible like that was in 1964. And our record here is something like 4,400 uh, of those units. I can't remember what feet or meters, but 4,400, I think, is a, is a number. Now, the French has gone down already to, to close to 6,000. The, Austral the Australian, I think, the Canadians, I mean, we're like number five or six in the line. Mm. Uh, okay? And we have nothing. The United States current plans on that are that by, by 2015, we'll be able to go down, hopefully, to 5,500 feet on an extension of the one that we have now. By that time, these people are going to be in Mars drilling through. So, so that's just symptomatic, and it worries me. I, uh, you know, I have a serious problem on, on, on how we're prioritizing things, how we're allocating things, and there's I find a lack of, not just the politicians, but the people in general, just a lack of understanding of, of the priorities. So that's very worrisome. Whether we will wake up, whether we will wake up and, and correct, I don't know. Okay. Now, on a personal level, uh, how do you either protect or take advantage of the situation? There's no question that there is Somebody's problem is somebody else's opportunity. There's no question about that. Okay. Uh, but what are they, and, and how do you take care of that? All I can tell you is that I'm worried. I don't have an answer. Okay. I'm worried. I, I didn't think that in my lifetime I was going to be this worried, and I'm worried. But what I can tell, all I can say to every one of you is that you need to be cognizant of your environment and what is going on. You can't just uh, slide along. I, I heard someone say something that is frightening, absolutely frightening. We have all this discussion about the debt limit and, and faulting and blah, blah, blah. What was the United States tuned to and all the TV stations in the midst of all of this? The Casey Anthony case. Okay? I mean, what the heck does that mean? To me, it's just... Uh, you know, uh, life is going by, and you are 
you are going blah 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 blah. I mean, I, I, I mean, there's a message in there as a country. I mean, we're having some real serious issues, and the country is tuning into the case Anthony case. That's all that, that is being that you see on TV. I mean, I, I got sick. I was turning the TV off because every station that we were, it was Fox or CNN or whatever. All I could see is the Casey Anthony case. I couldn't get news on on the rest of the stuff. So, I think we need to go through a, through a wake up period, and I hope that we do it on time. I don't know. Well, it wasn't the answer I was looking for. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I know. Well, um, I'm going to take this moment to thank you for coming I, I, here. Oh, go you ahead. Do that, I have yeah. one quick question. Okay. I'm curious, and I would appreciate it. Uh, give me any comments you have of what you thought it was good about the book, and what you thought it was, or you think is missing. That it, that you would. I'm not writing any more books, but but uh, <laughs> I'm curious. What on one punchline, what you found valuable and what you found that I was disappointed of that I didn't find, if anything. I like the uh, entrepreneurial training on page 288. Uh, you gave it like a, it came across as homework assignments essentially, which is what they are, but in reality, if we were to do every one of those, we'd be much more um, ready, I, I feel, to uh, you know, start a business or at least more aware of what's What's waiting us, waiting for us? You know, I, really, I thought that was uh, really neat how you provided that within your book. So it's not just information. Now here's, here's how you can, you know, apply it. Thank you. I think it's actually very helpful to see the real life examples that you put. There's like there's so many examples in the book that make us feel like it's actually possible. You know, it's not just a dream. You could actually do like so many other people have done. So I think the examples really help a lot. Thank you. I appreciated the way you talked about win-win situations when making a business deal. I thought that that was that level of cooperation, that wanting to bring the other person up with you so that both of you guys are going to be striving <coughs> towards that end was great. I think that the book would do better to have more of, to, well, to discuss the hidden costs in business such as the health ramifications of business, the loss of resources, and the uses, use of energy. Um, I think that talking about social justice issues, because I would like, I optimistically would like to think that, that as a business, a business holds a lot of power in, in making sure that environmental issues and social justice issues are connected with. Thank you. I really enjoyed chapter five, the problem solving chapter. I think that you could probably have written a whole book on just the first one, the variables and constants. I really would have liked to have seen maybe more examples or maybe how you personally used it in, in one of your ventures or endeavors or kind of really gone through it and how you sat down and, you know, maybe more insights into how you can because like you said, one man's constant is another man's variable and vice versa. And it'd be interesting to hear more stories about okay. what was surprising when you okay. sat down at that line. Thank you. Anything else? I like the story about the um, venture capitalist, the junior partner, and then the senior partner coming in to take over your office and kicking his feet up on your desk in terms of, you know, a position of power and how it was visible to the employees within your company and that created a lot of rumors but and you had to work really hard to uh, dispel those rumors that there was no buyout so just kind of um, you know real world examples of things you don't really read about in other business books about how human behaviors can really impact the business environment and it was refreshing by the way I have to tell you I there's a former employee of mine who in fact has done very well and I saw him on TV, uh, on a program, as his own program. And so I called him, and we had coffee. And he had read the book. And he said to me, on that particular story, he said to me, you know, Leon, to this day, that just made it, buying the book worth it for me. <laughs> because I remember walking by the office and seeing that fellow there, and I said, we're done. The company <laughs> sold. 
and and I never knew the story behind it, and and that was it. So I thought that was that was somewhat uh, interesting. That just happened a few weeks ago. I actually really like your uh, chapter uh, thirteen about how to succeed in the difficult economic times. It's very very helpful. It's some good ideas from that chapter. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry. So, well, no, I, I just want to thank you for coming, and I don't know if you have some time to hang out, and um, I think some of our students want you to maybe ask you to autograph their book if you are, w are you willing to stay for a few Please. minutes. And, no problem. So thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you.